Uh, this person is, is yelling at me, and a content reframe would be, well, it's not that they're yelling at you, they're just expressing themselves loudly, <laughs> you know, where you reframe the content so that it's, it's not this, you, you reframe as being something that fits all the description, but it's not quite, doesn't have quite the same implication. Context reframing is if somebody goes, oh, this person is yelling at me, you'd say, oh, that's great, they'll probably make a really good cheerleader you know, something like that, where you find a context where this behavior would be appropriate and thus not negative. So context reframe would be somebody says, oh, I'm so mad at my son Johnny, he, he, he gets in fights at school all the time. And you say, isn't that wonderful? I guess you never have to worry about your daughter being harassed on the way home from school. You know, oh, I never thought of it in that context. Now, those are very powerful reframes, and yet, a lot of times it's not easy just to come up with them. You can recognize them when they happen and go, oh, that's very clever. But it's kind of like the sense of awe that you have if you listen to some of the kind of things that Milton Erickson would do, you know, or go, well, obviously, I just looked at the person and I said, blop, you know, and he says something. Where you go, oh, of course, that's amazing, that's wonderful. How did he do it? And what sleight of mouth is about is to give you some more explicit ways to be able to do this kind of verbal magic. And rather than think of it as being verbal trickery, I prefer to think of it as verbal magic um, that really emphasizes the quote unquote power of the word. So what we're gonna be learning here is how specifically can you go about creating content and context reframes. If indeed beliefs are such an important influence on our lives, whether incidentally you work in education or you work in business or you work in therapy, or you just are communicating with a friend, beliefs are something that uh, are an extremely powerful influence in how you respond to people, how they respond to you. And what sleight of mouth gives you is rather than having to sit down and find their imprints or work through all these different things with their beliefs, gives you a means to be able to influence beliefs conversationally. And I think that's something that has extreme value no matter which context as a communicator that you work with. Uh, I think sometimes the power of somebody who excels, whether they, if they're, for example, a person who's an executive in a, a company or something, Part of what allows them to be able to function in this top level of their field is their ability to use language, their sleight of mouth capabilities, if you will. So that's sort of the history of sleight of mouth. It was an, it's an attempt to put into some kind of an explicit form the intuitions of people who are able to and have been able to influence beliefs in a powerful way through language. And I hope that uh, by the end of tomorrow, I, <clears throat> by the way, using this metaphor of John Grinder teaching the, <clears throat> the class of people, um, the meta model, please feel free to utilize all of your rapport skills as we do the exercises and so on and so forth here because sleight of mouth, much like uh, the meta model, can uh, be something that can create arguments as easy as it can uh, magic. So we want to keep that in mind too, consider that. What I'd like to do before I actually start introducing the, the material is to uh, pass out to you a set of handouts that will give you a whole bunch of information on what we're going to be doing. So why don't we take about a two or three minute stretch break and get these things Hand it out. I don't know what's the best way to do it, if we should have paper monitors or what. Okay. Now, before we can actually begin to, to obviously work with beliefs, we want to just define, well, what is a belief? And beliefs typically come in the form of a statement. Somebody has a, I mean, a belief is obviously a, a larger structure, but since we're going to be working with language, we're going to be identifying beliefs um, based upon the kind of structure that they have verbally. Now, 
What I'd like to have us start off with this morning is to get some examples, since this is going to be about um, changing beliefs and about influencing beliefs conversationally. I'd like to start by getting some examples of beliefs that you would like to work with, of beliefs that um, you might have found yourself coming up against, or of beliefs that you would like to have some more opportunity um, to have uh, working with. So what kind of things do you think would qualify as a belief? And what is a belief? Does anyone have one? <laughs> you have good ones, bad ones? Anyone have to confront typical beliefs? Yeah, one is responsible for your health. Okay, so a belief would be I'm responsible for my own health. The opposite of that, by the way, would be I'm a victim. I'm, I'm not responsible for my health. I'm a, I'm a victim. Or, you know, if my number comes up and this, you know, toss of the dice, and this random universe here, that oh, there's nothing I can do about it. So that would be a belief. Uh, the reason I say it's a, a belief as well is because it's not something that you can look at. If I say, this is a chair, you can look at it and there's certain ways in which you can define that. You can touch it, see it, hear it, feel it, present situation. If I say, you're responsible for your health, you can't touch anything or see anything. That's a statement of a relationship. It's a statement of a way of, of organizing your experience, not about a particular thing. What other kinds of beliefs might you have? Or might, those of you that work in business, what kind of beliefs do you run up against? Time is money. Time is money. Is that a belief or is that reality? No. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot of, I don't believe it. Either. Okay, so time is money. I mean, there's other things. Let's, let's think of some other kinds of things around time and money that people can have beliefs of about like, uh, there's never enough time to do what's really important. Sometimes people would have that belief. Or, I don't deserve to make the kind of money that I want. Those are beliefs, certainly, that limit people. I mean, there's no way that you can touch something, knock on it, <clears throat> hear it, see it, that's going to let you know for sure, in reality, if you deserve something or not. It's a, that's a belief. It's something that you either decide or you don't. It doesn't have to do with reality. It has to do with a, sort of a decision. It's a belief. So, and of course, the opposites of these would be that I do deserve money, that there is time to do the things that I need to do, or I can make the time. I can have anything I want. I can have anything I want. Yeah, so that's definitely a belief. And of course, of course, the opposite of that belief is things like people saying, well, if, if I want it, then I can't have it. Or it's, it's, a lot of times people refuse or they, they even stop themselves from wanting something too much because if they start to want it, then that's going to mean that they're not going to get it. Remember, I remember my brother doing this when I was a very young child. He wanted this, he came in uh, talking about this stupid cat, you know, and he didn't want this stupid cat, which basically meant he really wanted it, but you know, he was afraid of building the expectation you know, for it because then, you know, he would be disappointed if he didn't get it. So. How about I can be anything I want to be? I can I be anything. The way I want to look. Yeah. Now, actually this gets interesting because this, this is something we're going to be coming back to here. She says, there's a difference between I can have anything I want and I can be anything I want. And there's, to me, there is a very 